Good afternoon to all. It's a great pleasure to tell you that I've got two favored guests. I favor them, and I think many in the world favor them for very good reasons. Uh, they are, by name, Mark Stein, who's been with us often, uh, a journalist almost incapable of clearer definition, uh, except uh, I've always liked my particular sobriquet for him. He is um, an apocalyptic stand-up. Uh, he's funny, he's apocalyptic in that he sees disaster at almost every turn, but he remains cordially amused by it all. And with us as well, Lord Conrad Black, who's been here once before, a distinguished publisher, journalist, author uh, of a number of books, including most recently, and this one we discussed a while ago, Flight of the Eagle, which is essentially a history of and an explanation of the emergence of the United States. Both of these gentlemen are Canadian in origin. One might say the two most distinguished Canadians since Lord Tweedsmuir. Do I have that right, either or, or both of you? Lord Tweedsmuir was actually British. I know he was. He's actually John Bunyan, isn't he? Or, uh, John, John Bucken. John, yeah. John, John Bucken. Uh, Bucken, Bucken. Bunyan yeah. is Pilgrim's yeah. Progress. He was uh, he was a Scotsman uh, who who was uh, who became Governor General of Canada and uh, and is best known uh, for the novel the Thirty Nine Steps. Exactly the one. Hitchcock made a great movie out of. I've uh, unfortunately he died as a result of putting his toe in too warm a bath and it shocked him and he dropped dead. Is that a fact? I I've driven by the uh, the Governor General's house. One doesn't quite call it a mansion just a little bit north of Ottawa. It looks like a pleasant abode out in the countryside. Yeah, the one he really lives in, in Ottawa, is a pretty considerable house. Oh, yes. Now then, you are both Canadians and with strong views of and about America, and you've both had much experience in America. I might add, of course, uh, that uh, Lord Black was the publisher of the Chicago Sun-Times for a while, as he was of a number of other significant papers around the world, the Telegraph uh, in the UK, the Jerusalem Post, and various others. Uh, and Mark, Mark Stein was our best writer on all of them. Mark Stein has been in all of those papers, and he's still all over the place. Both of you are to be found in many locations, including the National Review. I've got a list of topics based upon uh, interests that you've expressed, either or both of you, in various recent columns, but I come first and necessarily to something relating to a brand new book by Mark Stein. Um, you remember Longfellow in his, um, in his poem Excelsior uh, speaks of, quote, a banner with a strange device. You've named your book for a banner with a strange device. <laughs> that's, uh, that's true, and, it, and in a strange way, it's connected to uh, to, to Conrad's uh, recent history too, we, we've both been on uh, the receiving end of the uh, U.S. justice system. Conrad uh, at the criminal end, and me at the civil end, and it's it's a dysfunctional system. I, I've been I'm now in the fourth year of a suit in the District of Columbia Superior Court, in which the man who created the global warming hockey stick. Uh, is suing me over a 270-word blog post. So the, the D.C. Superior Court can't uh, litigate this matter within half a decade. And I got fed up with hanging around waiting for them because uh, when you're in a lawsuit, you, you, get, uh, you, you prepare for trial, and then you sit around year in, year out, while uh, the lawyers and the judges and everyone else uh, discuss uh, how slowly you're going to move to trial. And right, the lawyers and expect to be paid all through it. Exactly. exactly. And for them, uh, the, the process is, is where the action is, uh, whereas regardless of verdict, for, for any, any uh, if you're the uh, defendant, the, the process is, is the punishment. Well, this is your third or fourth major trial. Uh, I am uh, rather given to uh, alliterative uh, uh, to alliterative phrases. Probably I was uh, uh, traumatized by too early a reading of Beowulf. But I think of you sometimes, Mark, as uh, li as licentiously litigious in that <laughs> you've been much in the courts or heading towards the courts. 
But let's come directly to the hockey stick. It is offered as proof that global warming is rushing forward and we are really endangered by it. Explain what it is. Yes, it's the most influential science graph of the 21st century. Uh, basically, if you're, if you're non-American, if you're anywhere else in the Western world, from Canada to New Zealand, uh, this was the graph that Western governments used to uh, sell their citizens on the Kyoto Accord. So it had real-life economic consequences. Um, Conrad and I, a, a Canadian, and the government in Ottawa sent uh, this graph out to every single household in Canada, saying, uh, this is what's happening, you're all going to fry uh, you've got to give us uh, the, the money, the power to tax and regulate you sufficiently uh, or the planet is going to get it and it's over. Now, and to, to strike an air of mystery, even before I explain why I'm doing it, I want to play a little bit of music. It's the only musical selection today uh, and it's sung by somebody with a better voice than yours, though you do an annual Christmas record, uh, but not quite as funny as you, uh, nor was he politically equivalent to you. You will recognize him. Here he is. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing Paul Robeson, uh, with the musical setting of George Kilmer's famous poem. You understand? A wonderful man in every respect except his politics. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but what relevance does it have to what we've been discussing? Yes, that's... Uh, the, the, if, uh, if Michael Bad uh, were, were uh, recording uh, Trees, uh, he would amend Joyce Kilmer, and it would be, I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree ring because he uses tree rings uh, to calculate the temperature in the 15th, 13th, 12th century. And, uh, and you assume that, as I said, great consequences flowed from this graph. Basically, uh, it showed that for 900 years, it was called the hockey stick, because from the year 1000 to the year 1900, it's as flat as the uh, shaft of a hockey stick. And then the 20th century, it rockets up like the blade of a hockey stick, uh, showing it going out the top right-hand corner uh, as, uh, and the planet's going to turn into a fireball. And everyone thinks that this must be done. It, to, to be able to divine the temperature of the 15th century, it must all be terribly scientific because otherwise the international community, the IPCC, the UN, uh, governments well, around the, the world... What's the correlation supposed to be? If it's a warm year, the, uh, the tree ring is, what, wider or narrower? Yeah, it's why do you can well there's two there's two views on this the tree rings uh, I think all of us at school insofar as tree rings came up learned that they were something to do with precipitation yeah. rather than temperature so the, there's a lot of controversy about whether you can even get a reliable temperature from them but he used for example for the years 1400 to 1429 he uses just he's just got one tree ring from one tree in the Gaspe Peninsula. And Conrad knows where that is, he, even if you don't, Milt. Oh, I've and been, I have this, been there, too, I must confess. Well, it's well, a lovely place in August, but not so good in January. Yes. No. <laughs> but the idea that this one tree in the Gaspé Peninsula, uh, which they, they, ought to have, uh, they ought to have signs, you know, on the border as American tourists drive in, you know, now entering Canada, home of the world's most influential tree, <laughs> Uh, this one, he, Michael Mann claims that this tree, one tree in the Gaspé Peninsula, can tell you the entire temperature of the planet for the years 1400 to 1429. Uh, he claims that two trees in the Gaspé Peninsula can tell you the entire temperature of the planet for the years 1429 to 1448. This is this isn't this this isn't science. This is this is 
it's rubbish. This, this is a traveling medicine show. It is complete rubbish. And, and that's why I put together a book, which is what real scientists, other scientists, think of uh, using one tree in the Gaspé Peninsula. You know, you might, you might, as, you, you might as well uh, claim to be uh, divining the temperature of the, uh, of the planet from the fibers in Conrad's exquisitely tailored suit, because it's, a, it's, a, it's no more scientific than that. Well, one let's, tree. Let's get, let's get and, and the temperature, even if it was, Mark, which it isn't, but the, the temperature in Gaspé, in 1429 doesn't mean it's the same temperature in China or Europe or Brazil. Let's get oh, clear on the dr- dramatist person, eh? Uh, who is Michael Mann? Well, Michael Mann was a researcher. Uh, at that time, he, he, he started in Massachusetts and went to the University of Virginia, and he's now at Penn State. Uh, and he basically uh, took all, uh, basically took these tree ring surveys, which all went up to about 1980 that other people had done. They, he doesn't actually go out to the Gaspé Peninsula uh, or up into the hinterlands and find these trees. Other people did it, and their uh, research was sitting around. And he essentially blended it all together and claimed to be able to produce the temperature for the planet. Uh, which nobody had ever done before. And as Conrad points out, the Gaspé Peninsula isn't uh, like many other places on Earth. He has. It I don't believe they have 600-year-old trees in the Gaspé anyway. They, they do well, on the West Coast in some places. We should Not check the Gaspé. sequoias of California. Yeah, and, yeah, and, that's, and that's the, right. the comparable tree redwoods in British Columbia. Yeah. yeah. No, and, I'm... And, and and he and he went uh, and he and he made a further error. That, I mean, that Conrad gets to the big problem with these tree rings. There's actually very few thousand year old trees, um, and the ones that are are not necessarily typical of anything. The, the, so so, the, but the idea is that people are easily impressed by science. And the minute Sir John Horton, who was the head of the IPCC, the big climate body at the time, uh, he appeared in front of a graph of the hockey stick. Uh, then governments picked it up because it's easy. It's the one thing everybody understands. And the science underlying it is complete nonsense. Now, sir, here's what happened. You wrote a skeptical, amused article about this uh, in the National Review. He wrote back to them and demanded that they uh, withdraw the article or otherwise dissociate from it, or or else he might sue. And uh, they didn't withdraw it. And you made a further commentary about the letter from him and he has sued you. And that suit is now about three or four years old, uh, but stuck in the courts someplace. Um, and ultimately, it may come before a judge or even before a jury. Is that the but case? But everybody knows, if I may interrupt here, as I, I mean, it's Mark's case and not mine, but everybody who has the slightest acquaintance with the law in the United States in these matters knows that the only grounds for defamation is if you can prove intent to defame. Exactly. It's a practical matter. There's no civil tort of defamation. And that is absolutely impossible in this case. So it is just a misuse of dilatory procedures to shut Mark down and stifle his right to freedom of expression while this absolute fraud artist, this scammer, flim-flammer, goes on with, with, with his fatuous fairy tales about the hockey stick. So Mark's response to this dilemma and to the lingering uh, litigation, which may ultimately reach the court, is to do another book. And what have you done in this new book? Well, I, I'm all, I, I love the way uh, the, he, he, he has made, as most climate people do, an appeal to authority. He has said that uh, the EPA has signed on to his hockey stick and uh, Noah, the... Uh, uh, the National Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, and and these various acronyms from the great alphabet soup of Washington all support the hockey stick, and uh, other scientists do. And uh, this is the, the appeal to authority is very popular among the climate alarmists. They say you can't. Well, they're fascists. Uh, yeah, and they and 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 they and they have the same prostration before authority. You can't write about it until you unless you're a PhD. So I just collected uh, various. Uh, PhDs and FRSs and even more uh, impressive uh, acronyms from around the world, from America, Canada, uh, Britain, Australia, from Europe, from China, uh, and put them all in a book. 
uh, of, of what sci- real scientists actually think about this guy. And I learned my lesson because I, I as you know, Milt, uh, I was on your show one time when I was in Chicago for Conrad's trial. More than and, once, actually, yes. And, and you realize, sitting sitting in there, you, you realize that um, it's, that if you if you if you settle down and just live on lawyer time, you're basically giving up your life uh, uh, for for the leisurely process of a sclerotic and dysfunctional court system. Now, let me tell you, uh, on the criminal side, it is it is in fact in many ways an evil system. I mean, yeah. dysfunctional, yes, but that's relatively neutral. It's merely expensive and inefficient. Well, we need to but talk on the criminal about, side, it is an evil system. We do need to talk everything. about that. I, I have about five or six topics I want to get the two of you, as Canadians who know America very well, uh, to respond to. But let me just note, uh, as we continue on this for a moment, first, uh, you have not yet done the obligatory thing. You have not given the title of the new book, so you <laughs> should do that quickly. Well, it, it's called A Disgrace to the Profession, the world scientists, in their own words, on Michael E. Mann, uh, his hockey stick, and their damage to science. And uh, now I should tell, I should tell Conrad Black, who is Baron Black of Cross Harbor, that a colleague of yours in the House of Lords, uh, namely Lord Monckton, um, of I forget what the rest of his designation is, is uh, certainly also equally critical, uh, and is in your camp on this issue. And appeared on this program once. I, I know him. He's a very nice man. I'm sure. Friend of mine. Sure. His his sister, by the way, as you would know, Mark, uh, is, was married to the former editor of the Spectator, where Mark and I also wrote. Ah, oh, yes. But he was one of the few spokesmen I've encountered who directly poo poos global warming as such, and certainly poo poos anthropogenic global warming, which is a fancy way of saying. That, More famous in the, their lordship's house is Lord Lawson, Nigel Lawson, the the, uh, the former um, the former um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and with Mrs. Thatcher, he does the same, does he? Yes. But here's my dilemma. Here's my dilemma. Here's my problem. I've been sitting chained to this microphone for many years, and uh, lots of the programs where you are uh, oriented towards science. One of my favorite sciences. I have no competence in it at all, except as a consumer, uh, is cosmology. And so I have, cosm- there's a big cosmology establishment at my university, the University of Chicago. I often have uh, guys from that bunch in, and other scientists from, or even evolutionary types, and, uh, and uh, phys- other kinds of physicists and uh, geologists, certainly only quite recently, whenever they are here, uh, and I'm talking about scientists from the University of Chicago, from Northwestern, visiting from University of Arizona or whatever. I don't focus on global warming, but as, a, as an aside, very often while commercials are on, um, I say, what's your view on global warming? They all say it's an established fact. We know it. It's a great problem. Uh, the critics are fanatics. Uh, they are resistant to a terrible problem facing mankind. I get that from most of the scientists of whom I make such inquiry. How does but, one but account Neil, for that? If I, if I may, the, the, the assault by Mark and many others, uh, Nigel Lawson, Lord Monkton, lots of people, uh, and outstanding scientists, as he puts in his book, uh, has been so vigorous and so unanswerable that they basically dropped global warming. Kyoto failed completely. It wasn't signed by anyone except the people who stood to gain from it. Uh, and, and, and we're now on to climate change. Well, yes, sir. You, you in Chicago particularly well understand that the climate changes between between January and July, but but uh, it's rubbish. There's not, there's nothing to it. Well, they offer We've other driven things. them off the global warming, uh, which they don't even contend is happening. Right of course, now. they offer something other than merely tree rings. They offer the rise in the oceans, uh, and I don't which know. is not in fact happening. Yeah, no, uh, no I mean, the polar ice cap. I mean, the the part of it that's uh, over land is not melting. And uh, and the world's average temperature has risen one centigrade degree. Tell me if I'm mistaken, uh, Mark, in 85 years. Well, that isn't global warming. 
No, and, and, the, and the fact is that they, the climate has this thing called natural variability. And, and, you, and, 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 and you know this as well as anybody, uh, because most, most of us did, it, did this at school before they got the global warming fe- uh, fever. 90 million years ago, they had alligators and turtles at the North Pole. And if there'd been a Sierra Club, uh, around at that time, they'd have been agitated because the the, uh, the uh, planet was getting colder and the polar bears were starting to prey on the last poor cuddly little alligators at the North Pole. That's, uh, that's geologic climate. And if the Earth decides that it's, uh, it's going to do that again, uh, then whether you're driving an SUV or drinking bottled water uh, or using an electric washing machine isn't going to make the slightest difference if the Earth decides... Uh, that uh, there's going to be alligators at the North Pole again. Uh, in particular, um, the the Earth more recently has emerged from the Little Ice Age, which uh, which start which was when the Thames was frozen. Uh, before that, they had the medieval warm period when they farmed in Greenland. Then you had the Little Ice Age when uh, the, in Europe it was bitterly cold, and you look at all the great paintings and all the national museums. And they show fairs on the ice of the great rivers of Europe. Uh, And uh, and Conrad and I are both Canadian. The entire political, economic, social and cultural development of Canada has been possible as the world emerged uh, out of the Little Ice Age. Um, uh, The uh, the, the, the joke about Canada is that 90 percent of the population uh, live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. If we hadn't come out of the Little Ice Age... 99.99% 99.99% of the population of Canada would live within 100 yards of the U.S. border. It'd be just like one condo development along the 49th parallel because it's the emergence from that that enabled you to have just about a long enough growing season up there for people to settle in small towns and begin to farm and begin to build society. So this idea that somehow uh, the emerging from the, the Little Ice Age in the 18th century has been bad for the world is complete nonsense because, uh, uh, because Conrad's country and my country uh, wouldn't... W- I, I very much doubt there'd be 30 million people living in Canada. If, and there if wouldn't be still... 10 million people in greater Chicago either. Now then, no. ge- gentlemen, uh, a quick transition is required. Uh, I, just as you, uh, favor capitalism, and therefore we have this strange indulgence that we do commercials uh, for uh, to buoy up the free enterprise system. We're about to do that. But before we do, another classical reference, really classical, uh, it was asked whether by Cicero or by somebody long before him in the Roman courts. The crucial question always is, QE Bono, who profits? I raise the question, looking for your response right after we take care of those commercials. Who then profits or who is advantaged by the rise of this great a uh, worldwide concern of uh, backed up by lots of people who do have PhDs after their names. This great uh, worldwide concern about the danger of continued global warming, whether we call it climate change or whatever. Uh, look forward to your response and then on to yet other important topics after we pause for this. And directly back to Mark Stein, uh, Stein and to Conrad Black. Uh, Conrad Black, uh, your book, and we discussed it uh, a little while ago, Flight of the Eagle, the grand strategies that brought America from colonial dependence uh, to world leadership. Simple, basic question. How are we doing on world leadership these days? Milt, I, I, it pains me to be a kind of irritating foreigner speaking to uh, <laughs> your listeners in Chicago from another country and, and being critical of uh, of your country. I think it's fundamentally rude and not something I would do. But since you asked me, I have to align myself with the apparent majority of Americans and say that your your famous fellow Chicagoan, the current president, in in my opinion, is not doing well. And basically it comes to, I think every everyone, every civilized person is delighted that the nonsense of a barrier for reasons of pigmentation is gone, and we all salute him for that, but uh, to, to hold that great office. But the in the 233 years of American independence prior to Mr. Obama's inauguration, the company accumulated debt of $10 trillion. Now it's $19 trillion. I have no problem with deficit financing in certain circumstances, like during the Civil War or the World War II. 
but or what Reagan did is a very short term measure and nothing like on that scale but you can't do that and and of course about 40% of it isn't really debt in the way other responsible countries uh, sell bonds at yields that attract arms length buyers they're just issued to a subsidiary of the treasury in exchange for notes that come across by email it's a, it, you know it's a shell game and the other thing is a great power and particularly a very great power like the united states uh, upon uh, upon whom so much of the world relies for the stability of international relations cannot take positions and back off them and appear to be intimidated by disreputable countries and when when the president and there've been many examples of it of which the most egregious is this Iranian business where it's dragged all the other major countries with it but in in Syria when he established a red line because the regime was using poison gas in its own citizens, dispatched naval units to make a punitive mission, then abdicated the constitutionally granted position of commander-in-chief to the Congress, which is nonsense. And then as the whole thing started to disintegrate and the Secretary of State said that what they had in mind was something that I quote, unbelievably small, which I believe prompted Senator McCain to say, well, in that case, what do you think the deterrent and punitive value of it is going to be? And then dumped it into the lap of the Russians, who I believe are the source of the sarin gas in the first place. You, you, I mean, it's not Paraguay. It's the United States. You can't do it and maintain any credibility. And it's a real problem in the world. It's a vacuum. But it's reversible, but it's a real problem. And I, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but do you... You asked me the question, and I felt I had to respond, frankly. And I can point both you and Mark, of course, to the area in which foreign policy has been most active or most inactive for the United States, namely the Middle East uh, during the last, well, during the uh, two decades of the new century, uh, the first full decade, which was largely in Republican control, at least at the executive level, and, uh, and now has been in Democratic control during the presidency of Barack Obama. Mark Stein, uh, what's your general overview? Yes, I, I, think, I think Conrad put it very well. When you have uh, the current president, by the time he leaves office, office it's entirely possible uh, he will have run up more debt than every single one of his predecessors combined. And I, w I would make just two observations on that. One is that um, you have nothing to show for it. Uh, that's what's fascinating to me about it. Uh, when when Obama goes around justifying the debt, he he tends to say things like only government can build the Hoover Dam or the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, well, where are the dams and the bridges? Um, if you go, for example, uh, to Scandinavia, they, they built this uh, spectacular bridge over the body of water between Copenhagen in Denmark and uh, Malmo in Sweden. It's called the Orison Bridge. It's about 20 miles long, and it means that uh, you can get on a train in Sweden uh, and be taking off from an airport in another country in about 40 minutes. Uh, There's the, 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 not even a way to get from uh, mid, uh, Midtown Chicago to O'Hare uh, that expeditiously after all, after all these years. So, so there's nothing to show for the money except bureaucracy and paperwork, which is kind of incredible to me. Uh, that that you, you you spend nine trillion dollars and there's nothing but a few more thousand bureaucrats uh, and a few more government uh, forms to fill in. Uh, there's nothing to show for it. Uh, nothing was done with the money. And I, I would add one further thing to that: that when you then the Liberal Party of Canada, which is not my party, and uh, and uh, Conrad feels warmer towards it than I do, but it's not particularly his party either. In the 1990s, they paid down debt. Uh, New Zealand is currently paying down its uh, what they call crown debt in New Zealand uh, at a spectacular rate. When you ask when you ask uh, Democrats or Republicans about paying down the debt, look in their eyes. They've no intention to pay this thing off, which is why even supposedly fiscally responsible Republicans uh, come up with these cockamamie plans uh, where they uh, pledge to reduce the, the uh, rate of growth in the federal budget by the year 2030 or 14 years after they've left office. There's no, when you look in their eyes, you know they have no serious intention of paying down, never mind paying off this debt. 
A, uh, no administration has paid down debt since Truman and Eisenhower. Uh, Conrad, right. let me read uh, simply the first sentence of a recent article of yours. It uh, goes back to uh, June of this year. There is increasing evidence that American politics is recovering from the dearth of good presidential candidates and potential candidates rising into governor's chairs and the U.S. Senate that has afflicted it for 30 years. Yeah. Um, and I think your governor now that we heard on the radio just at the start of this program is an example of it. Uh, well, your governor in Illinois, I think he's very good from what I've seen. He looks pretty good. He's brand new at the job. Yeah. Um, but uh, and he's not a presidential candidate. No, no, no but he's uh, illustrative of uh, you're getting good governors now, you know. And, and uh, it's, I don't want, again, I don't want to be a, an irritating know-it-all foreigner. I, I speak as an admirer of the United States, despite the fact that the country persecuted me after death. But, uh, but you know, it's been a while since you've had a good governor in Illinois. In Illinois in my opinion. Well, the, well, they get together in prison uh, to chat yeah, about a, That can be a badge of honor. It doesn't mean they're guilty of anything. I think <laughs> our last three governors have all done prison terms. Uh, two of them, no, one of them is uh, certainly still there. Uh, both of you have looked at American politics Mark writes about it more or less every day uh, in uh, Stein Online, a great site on uh, the Internet. And uh, Conrad writes regularly for various publications. As both of you look on at our presidential scene right now, and to be sure also the surprising, or is it surprising, emergence of Donald Trump as somebody that the public seems to be taking seriously and with some uh, um, with some affection, or at least with some approval. What do you make of it all? Uh, if you're asking me, I, 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 I mean, if I may start, Mark, please I'll preempt you. But the um, Milton, I think that um, uh, it, what I said in the thing you quoted, I, I, my view, as you would know, is that the, the Watergate process tore down an extremely successful and competent administration. And, and did terrible damage to the presidency, but it also, and we'll never be able to quantify this, I believe it discouraged a very large number of talented and patriotic people who in other times would have gone into public life from doing so, uh, because so many people were besmirched. I remember the confirmation hearings for Nelson Rockefeller to succeed President Ford as vice president, and whatever one thinks of Nelson Rockefeller, he, he was a perfectly honest man and a very dedicated man who, who obviously didn't go into public life for the money and, and, and was a four-term governor of a very large state. And, and uh, the questions were so uh, harassing and insulting. I, I, that sort of thing, I think, uh, poisoned the wells for a long time. And, and we got, frankly, comparatively second-rate candidates often running as president after, after Reagan and Bush Sr. And, uh, but I, I, I think that... Um, uh, that 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 has worn off, and and you now see coming uh, forward, particularly amongst the Republicans, but some Democrats as well, uh, very very talented, dedicated, uh, relatively younger people uh, who have some innovative ideas and 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 have some courage in office, and uh, and I find it I find it very encouraging. I mean, I, I'm not here to tout Richard Nixon; he had his he had his uh, peculiarities, but you know he came into office with 545,000 draftees in Vietnam, 200 to 400 coming back dead every week. No exit strategy, no exit. Hanoi had made it clear that if they wanted to capitulate and turf out the non-communist government in Saigon, they could have their POWs back. But that was it. They weren't negotiating about anything else. And and uh, the courts had ordered that school children primary school children all over the country be transported all around metropolitan areas to to uh, different racially different districts from where they lived in the interests of um, of equality of education a completely insane idea i mean a, a good goal but an insane way of achieving it and and there were riots everywhere assassinations skyjackings uh, no relations with china uh, and 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 no meaningful relations with the Soviet Union. He got the country out of Vietnam while keeping a non-communist government, abolished the draft, uh, created the EPA, ended school segregation, avoided school busing, opened relations with China, started a peace process in the Middle East, and signed the greatest 
arms control agreement in history with the Soviet Union. It was a brilliant administration, and it was destroyed for no good reason. I mean, Watergate was nonsense. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Nixon, uncharacteristically for men who had such a brilliant sense of self-preservation up to then, was so inept in his handling of it that, that he effectively cooperated with his enemies. But the damage to the country was terrible. And it's now quite clear that, that Woodward and Bernstein were just myth-makers. You can't believe a word they wrote about anything. And even, in effect, the late Ben Bradley said that. He said he didn't believe what they were saying. You know, he accepted his Pulitzer Prize, too, but he didn't believe it. And, and I think it, it did terrible damage to the presidency and to the national media. And, and I think it takes a long time to recover from that. But I think it's happening. And I thought that this group of Republican candidates on television the other day were very impressive. I thought they all spoke well. As for Donald Trump, who's a friend of mine, he's not a public policy expert. He's got a, a very interesting combination of commercially very successful man, dynamic personality, and a sort of archy bunker method of expression. And it, it, I don't think it'll get him into the White House. I don't think he'll win the primaries once the number of candidates comes down to a relatively small number. But, but he does represent a perfectly legitimate strain of opinion. And I think the Trump bashing that's going on in a lot of the media is outrageous. I, I think he's performing a service for the country, and he is not threatening to run as an independent. Donald is not going to waste a billion dollars of his own money just being a spoiler in an election like Ross Perot was. He's a sane man. And you would both agree, I'm sure, that the fact that two of the three leading Republican candidates, as measured by contemporary polls, have had no political careers. Uh, Trump flirted with it a little bit uh, once before, but never really was serious. Now he is, as is... Uh, 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 the third in command, the surgeon from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Carson. Doesn't that yeah. say something about America's fatigue with conventional politicians? Well, I, I think I, it probably I, does, yeah. I, I, think, I think there's no doubt that from the, the Republican point of view, uh, the, the process uh, failed the last, the last couple of times. It did not nominate... Uh, it did not nominate candidates in, in which uh, the base of the party, never mind anybody else, was sufficiently invested. And so I, 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 I look at it slightly differently than Conrad. Yeah, George I mean, I W. Think, was no prize either, though, Mark. No, he, no, he, no, he wasn't. Um, and I don't think it worked. I don't think it's worked well. And I, I'm, I'm speaking to you from New Hampshire, which is the first in the nation primary and where we all pride ourselves on being able to select and pick presidents. But I don't believe the system has worked. And, I, I, and one of the things that's enjoyable about Donald Trump, in the same way that uh, it's enjoyable to watch Bernie Sanders uh, remorselessly eating away at Hillary Clinton uh, at, at her lead on the other side. So it's not even it's not a partisan or ideological or public policy thing. But if you accept that the system has failed and if you accept that the system exists mainly for the benefit benefit of these vastly overpaid consultants who go from one losing campaign to another losing campaign. And again, from donors, incredibly wealthy donors, who the geniuses who picked McCain in 2008 and picked Romney in 2012 now want to give all their money and waste it again on Jeb Bush. It's just terrific to see a candidate who breaks all the rules, who doesn't have any consultants and advisors, uh, and who uh, says pays his he, own bills? Yeah, pays his own bills. Has is has a self financed campaign, and so far has spent about seventeen dollars and eighty two cents. Because uh, in in the twenty minutes between commercial breaks, he's getting all he's sucking up all the free airtime, and then afterwards, John Kasich runs some thirty second piece of soft focus pap about how he's proud to be the son of a mailman. And I'm sorry, but I, 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 quite, I, I like the way uh, Donald Trump uh, isn't doing the soft focus, proud to be the son of a mailman nonsense, because if you go back to those uh, debt figures that Conrad is talking about, these are serious times. And I don't care whether you're a, a casino owner and a reality show buffoon or the son of a mailman. It's what you can do about that that counts. So all the rituals of American politics, uh, the, 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 the soft focus ads, the consultants, uh, the, the advisors, 
uh, the, you can't say anything about John McCain. You can't say anything about hardworking Hispanics. You can't say anything uh, about Megyn Kelly uh, c- capable of, uh, uh, of misinterpretation. And the fact that he's just driving a coach and horses across every piety of the presidential nominating system is just hugely uh, enjoyable to watch. As we but go wouldn't towards you agree, the... Mark, that it must be said that uh, of the others, the conventional politicians, and I agree with everything you said, but they are a better group than we're used to. I mean, you know, four years ago in that party, you had Herman Cain, Michelle Bachman, uh, the governor of Texas, who, you know, has the revolver in his jogging shorts and so forth. And, and, uh, and Newt Gingrich is an interesting man, but he's completely unserious at that level. And, and here, I mean, in, I mean, you, you referred to Kasich. He's been a damn good governor. He was a very respected committee chairman in the Congress. He has had a career in the private service, uh, public, you know, in the private sector. And uh, Walker is your neighbor in Illinois, has been an effective governor. And, and uh, Jeb Bush was also an effective governor. I mean, I, I think you've You've got some capable people here who who aren't completely implausible as president. Gentlemen, as we uh, go uh, again towards some commercials, which are running rather late, I want to set up for our next phase simply this way, to remind you of the opening line of Lawrence Stern's uh, A a Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy, which is simply, in quotes, they order these things differently in France. Uh, It seems to me maybe they order these things differently differently in Canada as well. You're both Canadians who are half American by culture uh, and by uh, knowledge and investment. I'd love to hear what you've got to tell us about the difference between you, that is Canada, and us, that is the United States, right after we pause for this. Directly back to our guests. Uh, I am under uh, advice from three or four different sources, and I'm managing to, as they say in the United States, to screw up. Before I ask you uh, to to come back to the comparison between the U.S. and Canada as seen by two very well-informed Canadians. It occurs to me also that I did not... I, uh, uh, pl- I uh, planted the question, Huey Bono, after our first session, but I never uh, pursued it to get your answer. With regard back to the question of global warming and that whole movement, with regard to that, who really does profit? Why is it still uh, insistently pronounced by so many in science and beyond? Well, I'd, I'd say it's the, it's the easiest pretext for big government that's ever been devised, Mill. Um, it, it sounds uh, so benign. You're doing it for the future of the planet, uh, and it's a lot easier, I think, a lot easier for idealistic young people uh, to save the planet uh, than it is to figure out how to save their town or their county or their school district. So it appeals to the romantic in people. So government uses it, it uh, big government and particularly transnational government, because uh, if you're saving the planet, you can't do it at the municipal level, you can't do it at the state level, you've got to do it at the planetary level. Uh, and I think uh, somewhere at their Monday night poker game in hell, uh, Stalin, uh, Hitler, and Mao must be uh, sitting around saying, oh, it's about the future of all our children to save the planet. Why didn't we think of that? It's it's the most perfect pretext for big government that has ever been devised, and that is why big government is so wedded to uh, to the climate issue. But, Mark, do, wouldn't you say also that, that, that um, it, precisely on that theme, with the debunking of international communism, basically the collapse of international communism, and the the uh, exposure of a great deal of the left, the traditional left, as having been completely misguided in the democratic world, that it became this instant coalition where legitimate conservationists in the Sierra Club and people riding around on bicycles with butterfly nets and so on, were suddenly overwhelmed by this arrival of the old left. And, and so it became a vast coalition of the dissatisfied. And, the, and as you say, they took as their scutcheon this, this irreproachable cause of trying to salvage and redeem the whole world. And, and, and then on top of that, you get the charlatans who make money out of it, like Al Gore, who was the name I gave when you, when you put the question mill. I mean, I mean, Al Gore is a. I mean, I don't. I'm a capitalist, as you said, uh, uh, Milton. I don't begrudge anyone making money, and, and I, I, you know, that's fine. But we have to recognize the fact that 
the lie that Al Gore sold and made a lot of money and a Nobel Prize from was a fraud. Right. But and, how and, has this whole line become consensual in scientific quarters? Uh, as I was reporting to you before, my science colleagues from the hard sciences seem in the main totally committed to anthropogenic global warming. Well, I, I, I don't I, think we replied to it early. I mean, it, it, it had become the conventional wisdom before people like Mark and Nigel Lawson and uh, uh, you, you mentioned Lord Moncton uh, stood up and said, wait a minute. I mean, what are we doing? The, the king has no clothes. This is rubbish. There's no proof of it. And, 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 and it was just a long time happening. And it became, I guess, because everyone is in favor of salvaging the world and avoiding spoliation of the of the environment, it, it, it just it, it just crept through the doors and windows like green sludge before and was occupying our whole public square before anyone knew about it or recognized it. Uh, but, but, Mark, you would know better than I. You've been on the front lines of this. Well, well, you you know uh, better than than I do, Conrad. Uh, uh, Eisenhower's farewell address. Everyone remembers it for the military-industrial complex, but he also uh, raised alarm bells about what uh, what happens when science gets into bed with government. And the reality is now, for all the way that the scientists go on about uh, everybody being in the pay of the Koch brothers, everybody who disagrees with them or whoever. Uh, the fact is that the, uh, the government pays scientists uh, to come up with uh, a, a pretext for government action. Uh, so, for example, if you, if you want to come up with some uh, new regulatory scheme, uh, you, you give some money to fund a, a research project. The researchers depend on satisfying government. Most of the big researchers around, uh, around the world on this issue are doing it at the behest of government. Now, gentlemen, I must intervene and catch up with myself and discipline myself, uh, apart from uh, the mess-up that I made a moment ago because I was too late with commercials. We take care of some of those and then back for a longish session in which I will ask you to give us the Canadian view of the Canadian-American difference. And to Messrs. Black and Stein, uh, being Canadians, you are both francophonic, and you're familiar with uh, quelle est la différence entre l'homme et la femme, and the of conventional answer, la différence, vive la différence. But of course, the real answer is uh, based on wordplay. The real answer is la différence entre, and I won't go any further in defining that, but rather I ask you, quelle est la différence entre uh, le Canada et les États-Unis? What really is the difference between our two countries? What do we have to learn from you, for that matter? First what... of all, I want to congratulate you on your distinguished accent in France. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mark, do you want to start or should I? Well, uh, it, it's, it's, there are certain very obvious differences Built. Uh, you asked us earlier about the uh, the presidential election, where a year and a half away from election day, and yet the campaign is well underway, and people are spending money, and some of those candidates will be gone long before the first actual vote is cast uh, in the snows of uh, New Hampshire and Iowa. Uh, Canada is un undergoing a general election right at this moment. And uh, there was some controversy because instead of the usual six weeks, it's ex been extended to some uh, mammoth 11-week uh, campaign. But, but uh, in other words, Canada will start and finish its election campaign uh, well over a, a year before uh, your, your, your one does. The UK and it's usually, not a very energetic campaign the, at this point. The UK, you know, usually does it in, the UK usually does it in about six or seven weeks. Yeah, six it? weeks. 33 you, days in the UK, yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty standard in a in a in a Commonwealth uh, country. The yeah. the other difference is, we all started in kind of the same point. If you go back uh, to the Civil War, um, you uh, America had a Democrat and a Republican Party, and you've still got those same two parties today, and that's it. Um, Canada at, at Confederation in 1867 had a Liberal Party and a Conservative Party. Right now, in this election. Uh, there's four national parties and a Quebec separatist party. Uh, so if you live in Montreal, there are five potential uh, viable parties that are on the ballot, uh, any of whom could be elected. In the, it, they had an election in the United Kingdom 
a, a, a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago. In the 1868 election, every single constituency in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales was held by either a liberal or a conservative. Here we are, a century and a half later, there are 11 parties uh, represented in the House of Commons, not just the various uh, Scottish, Irish, Welsh uh, nationalist parties, but uh, there's been the rise of the Labour Party. Uh, the Liberal Party morphed into the Liberal Democrat Party. There's the United Kingdom Independence Party. In Canada, uh, uh, the, the, the original Liberal Party is still around, but the three other parties in their present incarnations are of much more recent uh, vintage. So uh, the United States has, uh, to an unprecedented degree in the Western world, an institutionally frozen two-party system in uh, fairness, you had the Whigs for a while. You've, you've had the Republicans and the Democrats <laughs> since 1856, no? Right, right. But, I mean, that is unusual, Conrad. Every uh, Parties, in the normal course of events, parties come and go. Uh, and, and it is a, a unique feature to America in the, in, in, uh, among developed countries that neither party... <laughs> Uh, apparently, is ever going to go, and nor is any other party going to join it. You know, Frank, and, 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 and you know this tendency, and you're absolutely right to make this distinction, but it becomes more pronounced when you get into non-English-speaking democracies. I mean, in the 11 years that General de Gaulle was president of France, the name of his own party changed three times. Right. Uh, right. You know, they, they're always dividing around and changing the names and moving all over, and you get these extraordinary groups in Italy and Germany, you know, the bandits and the, uh, you know, Grillo's party, the, the, the five-star party. And so on. It, 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 I mean, Canada and Britain are the soul of stability compared to, to most Western democracies. But you're right, the United States is, is unique in, in that stability. But in terms of, Milt, I, I thought you were putting the question about different, you know, just the psychological differences of uh, of the two peoples. And I, Well, I am quite interested in that, yes. Well, I mean, the United States is not for me to tell you or, or your listeners, but, uh, you, you know, it was founded in, in a, on a revolution based on a principle. It was, a, I mean, I don't want to be controversial here, but it was largely a tax war, the American Revolutionary War, but, but the principles enunciated were very electrifying, and they were put forth with extreme skill and eloquence by Jefferson and Thomas Paine and others and uh, and and it, it became a magnet for for seekers you know lovers of freedom in every land really including many people in Britain led by Edmund Burke and William Pitt the elder and, and Charles James Fox who basically agreed with the revolutionaries against their own king but the the uh, and then Canada was set up as a sort of amalgamation of the French who had been abandoned when the British army defeated the French army in Canada, and and the the Americans who departed the United States as it became out of loyalty to the British crown, and and Canada was kind of patched together from fragments, and it's and and it didn't have a revolution. It had to. It, it it was perfectly capable of throwing the British out the way the Americans did, but then then they w they knew they would then be taken over by the Americans. So, you know, that they had to get their independence from the British without so offending the British that the British ceased to protect them from the Americans, as they had done in the War of 1812. So in Canada, it's always been more ambiguous. As Mark said earlier, all, you know, 90% or more of Canadians live close to the U.S. border for climate reasons, but it, it, it's, it, they are people who, who in fact, apparently are very similar to Americans from northern states. It's almost Im impossible to tell a person from Seattle or Minneapolis from a Canadian from the nearest city across the border. But the, uh, there is a different psychology. I mean, it's, it's, it's a less uh, confident and less, um, um, uh, Let's say garrulous and and gregarious sort of society, but but it, it it does have other strengths. I mean, Canadians are quite successful. They they are quite reliable. They work hard, and they you know it's a relatively law-abiding place. It's not as exciting, but on the other hand, it's 
it's quite a peaceable and and successful country. But do it, you, it, however, it, it's, in, a, it's a more laid back attitude? Do you, however, in Canada, suffer the same plague of political correctness and uh, liberal excess? Uh, we have our that full share of here. that. Yes. And now, you know, the sociology is different. We don't have the legacy of slavery because there was never an economic reason to import slaves into a northern climate like this. They were economically effective in places where they were more efficient at harvesting crops in hot places like tobacco and cotton. And we don't have that here, or not much of it. But uh, that aspect of the political correctness and the victim culture and so forth, I'm being completely neutral. I'm not... I'm certainly not whitewashing slavery, but that complexity, uh, we never had it here, so it, so it is different. Both of you have uh, had... There are lots of non-whites in this country, but not because they were slaves. Both of you have had your turns in the courtroom. Mark's first uh, interesting case was the Muslims coming after him for being critical in print of the Muslims. Uh, and I wonder, for that matter, whether in general civil rights are now threatened uh, on that basis, both in your country and this country. And I wonder further whether, Mark, you remain as Islamophobic or at least as Islamo-worried, Islamo-anxious as you have been about the future of the West. Well, I think that's just a... I think that gets to what Conrad was saying about the psychological difference in that I think Canada in particular, but it's it's true of other countries within the Westminster tradition, um, is a little more at ease with uh, presuming... Uh, to to regulate absolute freedom. So Canada says it has freedom of speech, but it it sets up these hideous commissions uh, that presume to regulate matters between supposedly free peoples in a way that the United States would find utterly repugnant. I, I'm a free speech absolutist, and I'm happy to say uh, that we won a temporary victory up there in that uh, case, and the Canadian Parliament eventually repealed Section 13 uh, of the, its Human Rights Code. But here is your... a durable victory, Mark. I here is durable. Durable. well, well, it may, be, but 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 the di- the difference, uh-huh. I think, and I remember, um, I, I remember after the trial in Vancouver, I flew back to Montreal and drove back across the border to New Hampshire, and the the guy at the border looked at my passport. Uh, and he said, uh, what, what were you doing in Canada? And uh, I said, I've been, I was on trial at the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal for Crimes Against Humanity. <laughs> and he goes, oh, well, welcome back to the United States, sir. And I drove on, and I thought, what a, what a great feeling. But let, me fact- remind, let me remind both of you of something which much preoccupies people like me in this country. Uh, the First Amendment is there, but it is increasingly dishonored by political correctness and by political intimidation, much of it directed by the leftist press against uh, conservatives and conservative spokespersons in this country. I, I would I would agree with that, Milt. I mean, I'm learning that. I don't think it's much of a First Amendment, for example, in respect to the Michael Mann case. If it if it takes me uh, five years of my life and a seven yes. figure sum uh, to discover I have the right to to say a two hundred seventy word blog post, it's really not much of a First Amendment. But beyond that, I would say that uh, the culture of free speech is in despite the First Amendment uh, is generally in decline. Um, and uh, in the United States, and I think you see that in. Uh, in in uh, in the fact that it's not it's a very unlively press. Uh, the newspapers and the big television uh, stations are not uh, have reached a kind of consensus on what is an acceptable and what isn't. I mean, uh, for example, I uh, when Bruce Jenner uh, came out as Caitlyn Jenner on the cover of Vanity Fair. It was interesting to me that even a supposedly right-wing network like Fox News uh, felt obliged to report that event as a kind of celebratory, uh, affirmatory event. You would never have got the idea that there are, in fact, millions and millions of people who think what's going on is bizarre or objectionable or faintly ridiculous or, uh, or kind of just funny. The idea was that there is a correct tone and you're to put on a straight face, and it can only be discussed with these, within these well, narrow no. limits. Well, no. Conrad Black, you ran a major international publishing firm, newspapers uh, in many different countries. Uh, what has happened uh, to alter 
the performance of the press nationally and internationally? Well, in the United States, and here I, I would just add a sort of variation to what Mark said. Uh, I mentioned earlier the impact of Watergate. I I, I believe, and, and uh, I toss it out, I, you, you, you two and your listeners uh, may disagree with me, but I believe that uh, the national media suffered a, well, they showered themselves with, with uh, uh, self-donated awards and gifts and uh, pats on the back for the, the probe of truth and so forth. Uh, over over Vietnam and Watergate, I think the great American public uh, have grave misgivings about the extent to which they were misinformed and misled by the national media in both those terrible episodes, Vietnam and Watergate. And and, and I think that is really why these um, people on the sidelines have so undermined the credibility and the audience ratings of the national newscasts. I mean, when I was a younger person, Walter Cronkite and my late friend David Brinkley and others had a tremendous numbers of viewers, and they were they were they were generally believed. And I, you know, Rush Limbo has a, whose place mark you often take, but Rush has a far greater audience than any of these national news networks do, and I, I think it has become very fragmented. And this complements the natural tendency in the media from the expansion to a practically unlimited number of, of television channels through satellite and cable, and on top of that, the internet with a picture definition equivalent to television. So there's a, a, an unlimited flow of sources uh, of opinion and entertainment, and so there's going to be fragmentation anyway. But I think the, I mean, I think you're right to to uh, speak somewhat contemptuously of the political correctness of most of the mainstream national media, but I think their influence is withered by 80%. I'm being arbitrary, but some very large proportion in any case from what it was. I mean, it used to be that people would read a couple of the big newspapers, watch one of the big three networks, listen to uh, probably the networks on the radio or the big station in each center, and and uh, and someone like Walter Lippmann would influence millions and millions of votes. Ah, uh, yes, but here is a disturbing fact. Their influence has increased in another major institutional sector of the society, namely uh, the academic uh, institutions, yeah. the colleges uh, true. and I, the I, universities. I, now, that's, that's another matter. I agree. For some reason, they have apparently taken over most of the commanding heights of academia. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, and I would, I would say that's actually uh, why this is not a society that's particularly friendly to free speech anymore, because... Uh, we have had two generations of uh, American school children who basically have Quite been so. uh, marinated in a uh, in a uh, a culture where self censoring is the uh, natural course of events. It's, it's and, been and fascinating. And extreme reproachfulness to the traditions of the country. Yes, you you would think so, but they don't care about that. I mean, I, what I find interesting. Well, is they don't get... know about that. Their historic knowledge is very limited. Well, that that's true, but I uh, but it's also the case that if you were to speak to them about a big principled uh, issue like free speech, and you can, and it's true they are historically uh, ignorant, so they're not going to be impressed when you quote Milton at them uh, because they never heard of the guy, so they're not 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 you, Milt, <laughs> the other Milton. Um, they're not going to be they're not going to be impressed by that because they, they've never heard of the guy. Uh, but it goes beyond that that they actually have been taught uh, that free speech is uh, subordinate. Uh, to the right yes. to be respected for various ident what it, whichever identity group uh, you happen to identify with, or the guy across uh, the dorm hall corridor identifies with, which is why we've had this spate of uh, comedians just in the last couple of months, Jerry Seinfeld and people, uh, talking about how they can't appear at American colleges anymore because they're, they're speaking to a big bunch of people, 19, 20, 21, 22, with their arms folded, Quite so. who are saying, that's yeah. not funny. Exactly. And we have interna they have internalized, without a state commissar, but they have somehow managed to internalize uh, the same kind of attitudes uh, to, uh, to jokes 
that officialdom had in the uh, in communist Europe uh, from from uh, from the Second World War to the uh, end of the 1980s. So you know, remarkable. so you know that's uh, why. Okay, can I can I put forth a proposition to to the two of you? Yes, please. I I, I put it to you that the great irony of contemporary affairs, I, I mean international affairs, is that we owe without question the triumph of democracy and the free market in the world to the United States. It had allies, of course, but it led the alliances. And no one who values any definition of democracy or the free market can fail to remember and be grateful for the fact that the United States led the world to the state where it it is now largely uh, a a world of of somewhat democratic countries operating more or less of a free market in, in most places. And that was certainly not the case when I was a very young person. But the irony is that the United States itself, and I I believe me, Milt, I take no pleasure in saying this, but it is not one of the world's 20 best functioning democracies. You get outrages like what Mark is being subjected to, dragged through the, the, the hideously expensive dilatoriness of the American legal system in order, in effect, to deprive him of his First Amendment rights for an indefinite period. Uh, you, you have a criminal justice system where 99.5% of the accused are convicted, 97% without a trial, because the prosecutors are terrorizing the living Jehovah out of the whole country. I mean, it is now clear that your former U.S. attorney, my dear friend Patrick Fitzgerald, uh, uh, produced phony evidence, which he knew to be phony, in the in the Scooter Libby case, a man who was the chief of staff to the vice president, it, it's quite clear that the late Senator Stevens from Alaska was convicted on the basis of fraudulent evidence, and the conviction was overturned after he'd lost his election. Uh, and, and 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 they just carry on. There's no sanction. Nobody does anything. It just continues. I mean, it is not democracy. Of course, the U.S. is a democracy, but it's not a very well-functioning one. Gentlemen, I must discipline myself more than I did the first hour. We're due, a bit overdue for some commercials. When we come back, I do want to get to the question of uh, the anxiety expressed some years ago by Mark in his book, um, America Alone, uh, about the Muslimization of the West. And then in his following book, even the Muslimization of America. And I want also to know what, how the two of you respond to the, uh, the Muslim radicalization of the Middle East, which poses the ultimate foreign policy challenge to, among other things, the American government. Merely that when we return after this. Hi, this is Milt Rosenberg. Would you like to hear my conversation with Margaret Thatcher, with Barack Obama, with Jimmy Carter, Carl Sagan, Henry Kissinger, for that matter, with uh, Charlton Heston and lots of other famous Hollywood stars? Or would you like to hear a discussion that we ran about the rise and fall of Greek civilization or the rise and fall of Roman civilization or the history of American radio or hundreds and hundreds of other topics? and guests. They are all available for you in a great audio archive, which you get to by simply going to MiltRosenberg.com. MiltRosenberg.com will take you to an audio archive which has built up over the last 40 years. Yes, there's a small paywall you got to get over, but if I say so myself, it's more than worth it, as many subscribers have attested. So go to MiltRosenberg.com, examine what's available there, join us. You'll learn something, maybe a lot. And of course, from both Conrad Black and Mark Stein, all I want to do is say once again, Muslimization of the West and of the East itself, in its or the Middle East, in the radical form. Uh, what, Mark, what do you think when you reread your book, America Alone? Well, I, I I think it's it's unusual to, to write a uh, a popular bestseller about demography, which is which is a fairly dry and dusty subject. Uh, but I was uh, concerned uh, at the the fast growing demographic transformation of some of the oldest nation states uh, on the planet, uh, particularly in uh, in Western Europe. That trend has acceler- accelerated in the uh, last. Uh, decade to the point where, um, in in uh, certain uh, uh, Belgian and Dutch cities, for example, uh, th- there are more people in the Antwerp school system 
uh, they have to choose, a, a, take a confessional class, in other words, a religious class. There are more people who choose to, to choose uh, Islam now than choose Catholicism for their religious studies because the future of Antwerp is Muslim. The future of Marseille is Muslim. The future of Rotterdam is Muslim. The future of Malmo in Sweden, which I mentioned earlier, is Muslim. Uh, compounding that, you have the implosion uh, which has often been due to inept uh, U.S. foreign policy uh, of uh, a large number of states in uh, North Africa and the Middle East, so that you now have a refugee problem uh, where Libya has completely collapsed and its coastal uh, cities are controlled by uh, ISIS, uh, and they're putting people on boats and sending them over to Italy. So if whatever you think about the Rio Grande as your southern border... Uh, what Europe is facing on its southern border uh, is is a problem that's many times more dramatic than that. And if you look at, for example, right now in the news, uh, there's some there was some guy who basically uh, ran through the Channel Tunnel. Uh, a uh, a Muslim refugee ran through the Channel Tunnel, dodging the trains uh, to get into into the uh, United Kingdom. So what is happening in Europe? Uh, that has been compounded by the end of the uh, what I would call the rise of the post-Western Middle East. The Middle East was invented by the uh, British and the French over a pleasant lunch in 1922. Uh, as British and French power uh, waned after the Second World War, the, the Russians and the Americans stepped in. Uh, the Americans kind of won that one and the, as the Soviets faded from the scene in the 1970s. Uh, but what has happened now under Obama is that he has essentially left a vacuum of Western power in that region, and uh, ramshackle but functioning nation states have collapsed, uh, sending a huge tide of people, displaced people fleeing, and if they can get away with it, fleeing into Europe. Bad picture. Not a very uh, happy may prospect. May I say something on that? Please the, uh, do, sir. Uh, we, we, well, that guy who ran through the Channel Tunnel, Mark, we should remember, was just going from France to England. I mean, right. fine, he was a Muslim, but, <clears throat> you know, he was fleeing from one Western European country to another. But the, the, um, uh, I, I guess I agree entirely that, that there, the, the policy of the current administration has aggravated things, but, uh, but by its inconstancy, but, uh, the previous administration's pursuit of democracy helped destabilize a number of these countries. I mean, that led to the electoral victory of Hamas, the electoral victory of Hezbollah in Lebanon. It, it weakened the regime in Egypt. And I think we must at least recognize our good fortune, we in the West, that the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been the 900-pound gorilla in the room of the, uh, of, of the uh, Arab world for, for, for 80 years, uh, had their moment of power and failed, and they lost it. And we now have an, an Egyptian government far more amenable to the West than, than we've ever had since Sadat. And right. um, I think the key to this is it is essentially a council of desperation when you get uh, such a disreputable and objectively loathsome movement as ISIS actually in charge of any organized territories, even even just patches of them. But uh, I think that essentially the, the, the Muslim Arab world feels that it has been in retreat since it was thrown out of France in the 8th century and then out of Spain. And, and, and in their frustration, they're reaching uh, a political extremity in some parts of their society. Uh, but I don't think it's that representative. It certainly, in its militancy, can be extremely troublesome. But ISIS, all of ISIS, has under 100,000 adherents, as far as we can see. What could or it's should... It's up to these Muslims to assert themselves and have the, the yeah. responsible, reasonable Muslims prevail over the extremists. But let me, let me, do it. Let, let, hold on, hold on, Mark. Let me press on with this, bringing it back to something we discussed uh, only briefly earlier. What should a new American regime, particularly if it's not uh, Hillary Clinton uh, or, uh, for that matter... Uh, uh, the socialist from your adjoining state uh, uh, as president. What should a new American regime, regime, what should or could a new American regime do about the Middle East at the moment? 
Well, I, I think you have to uh, you you have to uh, fight uh, the ideology, which is more important uh, than boots on the ground. Boots on the ground or drones in the air is is not sufficient in this kind of struggle. And this goes back uh, to what Conrad was saying a moment ago when he rightly criticised um, the Bush administration. Uh, for this idea that you you just land there, you topple the dictator, and then you hold an ele- uh, hold an election. The one advantage you asked us earlier about the difference between Canada and the United States, the 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 the, the, the one advantage we old school imperialists have uh, uh, above you idealistic Republican Americans is that uh, is that we understand that the vote, the election, is the last piece of the puzzle. First, you have to. Uh, export your values and build some kind of functioning society, as uh, they're by no means uh, perfect uh, polities, but nowhere is. But uh, in India, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, these are these are places where uh, the the British uh, were concerned not just to send in armies and uh, not just to hold an election, but actually to implant. Uh, the law of contract to implant a legal system to implant the idea of uh, non-tribal uh, organizing mechanisms for society, um, and if you if you America doesn't have an imperialist bone in its body, um, and that means that if you you can't just uh, work on the assumption that basically it's like Bernie Sanders Vermont and that everybody wants to be like Vermont if they just get the chance. So you can't drone the bad guy, land, and hold an election. That is a complete waste of time. But at the same time, uh, you can't just export uh, lousy movies and uh, caterwauling pop stars and, and, uh, and cheeseburgers around the world. You have to export the best of your values during your moment on the stage of history. Excellently said. I agree totally with what both of you have put forward but I still have, we all have much uh, reason to worry and to worry a great deal. Right now, uh, some quick commercials, and then I must read you some emails that have come in, uh, strong questions for both of you, and we return right after this. And gentlemen, let me quickly read to you a number of emails. I'll look for fairly concise answers so we can get through this batch. Uh, For Lord Black, how does he see the future of the newspaper business? Some have been able to make a paywall format work, while others give everything away for free. How are some successful with this model and what makes others fail? Also, how does he feel about the quality of news with so much downsizing of on-the-ground news gatherers and so much consolidation having destroyed the size of the workforce? Oh, we have lost uh, Lord Black temporarily. Therefore, I will go. um, I didn't know that at the time. He is back. Uh, did you hear the question as I read it? Uh, I'm, I'm afraid not. My, my phone went dead. Just going to do it again. Here we go. Uh, for Lord Black, how does he see the future of the newspaper business? Some have been able to make a payroll, rather a paywall format work, while others give everything away for free. How are some so successful with this model and what makes others fail? Also, how does he feel about the quality of news with so much downsizing of on-the-ground news gatherers and so much consolidation, which has destroyed the size of the workforce. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, I, I, first of all, the the implicit uh, message of the question I take it to be the following fact, and I think it is a fact that no business in history has given its chief product away indefinitely without going bankrupt. So the paywall is going to have to work. Uh, and and for and for those who don't try it or those who try it and fail, they are going to go out of business. Now, I, I think that, in fact, we've reached a point where all people who buy a newspaper in a prosperous country like the United States or Canada are ABC1 readers, meaning relatively high income and high education, and they are not that cover price sensitive. You can raise the cover price and increase your circulation revenue if you give uh, value for money, and that addresses, I think, the second part of the question. Uh, the answer isn't just to keep laying off staff, including reporters, and re- relying on uh, wire services or other sources. You're just lowering the 
quality of the product and reducing the value of the trademark. And uh, at some point, that process has to be reversed or the, the entire business will fail. But we do have the example of the Wall Street Journal, which, which is holding its circulation, making a paywall work, and is a very good newspaper. So I think the answer is we will end up with fewer but better newspapers and, uh, and, and a, a more successful effort by the newspapers at offering an online product. But that means a, a designer newspaper for a paying subscriber. So you, you feature the, the subjects of the news and, and uh, comment in the order specified by the individual subscriber, and that's what that subscriber gets for paying for it. But when you turn it on, you get what you, Milt Rosenberg, or you, Mark Stein, have said uh, that you want. You want to feature, you know, whatever it is, American politics, baseball, men's fashions, whatever it is, in the order you want it. And, uh, and then you have all the links to YouTube and the archives, and that's what you're paying for. And, and if, but the printing then would be on a home printer. So the distribution cost and the newsprint cost, which were the bane of the newspaper industry, are, are uh, eliminated in the first case and laid off on the subscriber and the other. But there will be some printed newspapers, but fewer of them. Uh, that was, I'm, I, I mean, it's a terribly complicated subject. And I don't mean to be a windbag. But that's the best I can do in a short time. You've done fine. We're just getting quick answers to uh, some rather demanding questions. Here is the next one. This is very demanding, yet very simple. Uh, please ask both uh, of your distinguished guests on the phone. Can Trump win? I didn't think he could win. I, I, I thought when he started that uh, with that kind of rather eccentric press conference at which there apparently were uh, members of Acu Actors' Equity who'd been <laughs> brought in to uh, play his supporters, that he was going to be a two-, three-, four-week wonder. Uh, in the most recent polls, he's got 25% uh, favor him, and another 10% say he's their second choice as candidate, presumably if their first choice drops out, as several of them will before Iowa. And he won't be, uh, he won't be one of the ones who does drop out uh, before Iowa uh, or New Hampshire. If it, if it were to come down to Trump versus the establishment candidate, uh, if that establishment candidate were to be Jeb Bush or whoever, um, I don't think you should rule out that that Trump couldn't uh, can't can't pull that off. And I think that's uh, he, he's the, the the dismissal of him that he's a buffoon who's going to implode is not true. Conrad knows him very well. He's not a buffoon. Uh, he's smart enough to play a guy who seems, as Conrad said an hour and a half ago, who seems like an Archie Bunker guy uh, when, uh, when, when he's on TV, and that's why he's popular on TV. But the idea that he's just, just some bumbling bozo who's going to implode, we should know is not true by now. And that means that if he plays things as savvily as he has done in the last couple of months, it's not impossible that he could emerge as the candidate. And that after question, that, all bets are off. Uh, that question comes, by the way, from John, who's listening online uh, in Columbus, Georgia. And so directly to Conrad Black with the same question. Let me add, can Trump win? Would you like him to win? Um, as, as Mark said, as I said earlier, he is a friend of mine. And I've, uh, he's a very fine man. He's a generous man and a loyal friend. But um, I, I wouldn't say he can't win. And I certainly agree with Mark that the, those who tried to describe him as a buffoon and a bumbling so or whatever your phrase was, that's rubbish. Of course, he's nothing of the kind. He's a very intelligent man, but he, 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 he is a little reckless sometimes in the issues he takes on, like that nonsense about where the president was born and so on. But um, uh, I think it is unlikely that he will get the nomination because I, I agree if it was a straight competition between Donald and someone who was just covered from head to toe with the imprimatur of the party establishment, he might defeat that person. But I, I think when you when you I think he'll hang in there a long time as as a viable contender. But I think when it comes right down to it, someone that can't uh, have the establishment tag hung around his neck like a toilet seat is a new face, and if need be, will will make more Trump like noises. We got a long way to the convention, you know, a a year, a full year. Um, uh, would would probably get the nod because you know Donald he 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 is certainly uh, not to be underestimated but 
but there is a very large chunk of the elected will I mean the whole electorate, not just the Republican Party uh, supporters. Here is another won't buy that guy. So I, I would say it's unlikely he would win, but anyone who dismisses him is being foolish and unjust. Here is another email directly to you. Uh, glad to hear Lord Black on the show. I have to tell you, the Sun Times, as a daily paper, is a <laughs> shell of what it once was. It used to be stuffed full of information. Now it's only a few pages with little more than race baiting and a few scandals and an update on yet another taco restaurant updating in Hipsterville. I, I'm sorry to hear it. I, I'm afraid it's not a unique experience. Some of our other papers uh, have deteriorated as well since we had them. But uh, look, some of it is, is bad times. I, I don't want to disparage anyone trying to make their way in the newspaper business now, but I'm sorry to hear it. Can I, I, I just say some, something on that? Do please. Uh, Milt, because as you know, I used to appear in the uh, Chicago Sun Yes, indeed. And in fact, I fell out with them uh, during Conrad's trial. When I remember I wrote well. A, uh, a pro Conrad column uh, that uh, the editors refused to run. The editor was a completely contemptible little toad of a man uh, called uh, Cook. Uh, he was now who, inflicting who, himself on readers of the Toronto Star, by the way. Yes, I, I know, and he owes his entire. He's like many many of these people. He owed his entire uh, career and elevation to Conrad. He'd and still yet, be chasing ambulances in Edmonton, Alberta, if it wasn't for me. Yes, he would uh, absolutely, and he owed, he owed his entire career to Conrad. And people can say what they want about Conrad Black, but he was about the last guy on the planet who genuinely loved newspapers and loved running newspapers. He wasn't like Rupert Murdoch, who, you know, had a, started at a newspaper in Australia, uh, uh, but basically now makes superhero movies that subsidize somewhere down the line the New York Post. He's, he wasn't like that. Conrad loved newspapers. And all those people who turned against him at the Chicago Sun-Times, I'd like to think a couple of them uh, were listening to this, uh, ought to know that what's happened to that paper uh, since Conrad and his associates were forced out of it, was entirely predictable because Conrad and his guys love newspapers and that uh, deceased banana magnet and all the other uh, incompetents and boobs who took over that paper after Conrad, they knew not a thing about newspapers and, and, uh, and they didn't love it either. And that's why it's that, uh, you know, supermarket giveaway sheet that it is today. Let me attest that one of Conrad's papers, which still holds up, with very considerable quality, is the Jerusalem Post. I think it's an excellent source of information about the Middle East, and it has lots of fine feature writers as well. Uh, one of them, one of the leading columnists, Ka uh, Caroline Glick, uh, yeah, is, very, very good. Uh, is a very native good. Chicagoan, and whenever she's back in town, as she is every so often, uh, she comes on this program. She was with us only about two weeks ago. Next uh, question or comment. Um, when the last glacier in Greenland melts, the first farm that the Norse abandoned due to a shortened growing season will be revealed. Elsewhere, the threat of cheap grapes from England hurting France's fruit began to abate. Short version, it was much warmer in Europe. Uh, may or may not uh, get that warm again. What do you think? Yeah, uh, I, I was... Uh, I defer to Mark as the climate expert. Right. Well, it's, it's the 800th anniversary of uh, Magna Carta uh, in, in June. Uh, Magna Carta was uh, signed in June 1215. And uh, I remember being taught as a schoolboy that it was about one degree warmer in 1215 uh, than it is now, which is why they had all those vineyards going quite high up the spine of England uh, up, up, toward, uh, up toward Yorkshire. And it was a very beneficial time for Europe. I mean, climate and progress are, uh, are connected. The, the, this idea that uh, the, the, the climate change alarmists are right to that degree, that there is a link uh, between climate and general societal well-being. And during that medieval warm period, uh, not only individual liberty, but the arts and science and industry all flourished. Um, so this idea that somehow uh, we, need to, we, we, we need to regulate the world into being two degrees colder and, it will all, and, and we will live much better, 
uh, I think is complete nonsense. I'm glad I'm I'm glad we emerged from the Little Ice Age. I don't want to go back to the Little Ice Age. Uh, and basically, if Mother Earth or God or whoever it is is going to stick it to us, uh, they're not going to decide that on the basis of whether we have a carbon tax. So you will allow me to put a little coal on the fire, even if even if the president doesn't want me to. No, you you go if you want to if if you want to take the your vast radio profits, Milt, and open <laughs> up a coal mine. I would encourage you to it. do it. Yeah, all right. You got to uh, do something in the winter in Chicago. True. Uh, next email. Uh, uh, I read. This is for Mark Stein. We love hearing him on the radio, though not as much as you, Milt. Uh, that uh, is a poor judgment. Uh, my favorite person on the radio is, in fact, Mark Stein. That's me talking. Back to the email. Is Rush Limbaugh ticklish? I don't know why that is asked. And then, but seriously, might we ever hear him, meaning Stein, on the air daily? As long as it's not between 4 and 6 p.m. Central, we would listen daily. Uh, I, I think you need to know uh, when you're a a dilettante and when you're a, a, a fellow who can do it five days a week like you and Rush do, Milt. That's an entirely different skill set. Um, Con- Conrad has a television show in Toronto, and he he has so arranged his life, and the uh, network is so keen to accommodate him that they come round. When I was interviewed on the show, they come round and they film it in Conrad's house. So he 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 basically has to step from one room to another, and he does his television show. And I'm sure Conrad would be the first to say that's very different. Uh, you know, from anchoring uh, Good Morning America from six to nine uh, every uh, every weekday, five days a week for for however long it is. I'm a dilettante. I like coming down from the White Mountains and dabbling in a little uh, light three hours radio hosting uh, once every six weeks or so. But but that's that's doing that five days a week uh, for as long as you and Rush have been doing it. it that's of an entirely different order, and there's very few people anywhere uh, who can do it as well as you guys do for that long, every day, five days a week, decade in, decade out. It would be great if the two uh, payoffs were commensurate between Rush and me. I fear they're not. Uh, uh, next, I just heard Black mention something very, very important. Some radio shows reach far more people than do the television news channels. Yet, by virtue of their medium, it is visual. We seem to give them much more importance than many of their rivals like radio and the Internet get. Does he see uh, TV being superseded by the digital outlets? Uh, not exactly, but I, I'm, I'm sure that is true. But to the to the extent that, that the, you know, the Diane Sawyer, and I have nothing against her, she's a perfectly nice lady, but uh, it gets more attention. It, 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 they, not from the public, she doesn't. From the media backscratching group in that, amongst the networks and the, you know, the national media, the traditional national media, they are forever conducting their log rolling backscratching society, and some of the people deserve the attention more than others. Uh, uh, and I'm not denigrating Diane Sawyer, but the, but the fact is, Rush has, as you would know this, Mark, but I believe he has on average 27 million listeners every day. I remember when he plugged my book the way you very kindly did, Milt. I mean, just made a nice reference to it and put it in, in his, uh, on his website. Uh, I went from, I think, 146 in sales to, to sixth and remained there for two weeks. I mean, it, it, that questioner is absolutely right about the attention in the echo chamber of the national media. But amongst the great American people, I think, I think Rush Limbo has a far greater following than the National News Network. Here is television. something, however curious, I wonder how both of you would respond, and I fear we've only got about two and a half minutes left. Cumulus Media, who now own uh, WLS in Chicago, which is the location for the Limbaugh program, are divesting themselves as quickly as they can of all conservative talk shows. They've turned essentially into a kid-around radio station rather than a politically oriented station, except for the presence of Limbaugh, uh, played uh, during uh, uh, the midday, and Levin played rather late at night. What do you make of that, Mark? 
Well, I think I think Rush is is the best at what he does. And the thing is, everybody thinks they can do that. Everybody thinks they can just open the microphone and uh, start talking about politics, uh, and the, and then finish three hours later, and they'll have a great show, and that anybody can do that. And I think there's no doubt that in in fact, what Rush does is is a relatively rare gift, and that there are thousands and thousands of people, as Conrad and I well know, every time uh, we launch a book and we have to go and be interviewed by some guy at uh, WZZZ in Presque Isle, Maine, or whatever. There's a lot, an awful lot of people who should be in an entirely different business who aren't very good at it, and and I can understand why uh, at a flagship station you think, okay, Rush is Rush is good. Uh, but the guys before him, the guys after him, maybe we should be trying to do something else. There is more room for flexibility in the talk radio format. And if you're going to be a talk radio personality, uh, you have to. You were you were quoting uh, Lawrence Stern and uh, Joyce Kilmer, and you have your vast hinterland. Uh, Milt, which I think is absolutely essential to being able to say something interesting to people for three hours. It's not enough just to say, well, you know, Lindsey Graham is up point oh 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 three of a point in Iowa. You've got to be better than that. And, and you can't be just a blowhard. I mean, I'm, uh, some of these people... I must I'm say, not going to name excuse, any names. I'm certainly not referring to Russia. Do, do please think. excuse me, but we've we just got about 10 seconds left. Hmm. So go ahead for 10 seconds. Well, yeah, just... Uh, some of these people are simply blowhards and nothing else, and it's no wonder that they don't last. I'm deeply indebted to both of you for joining us. It's been a boon uh, for me. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Milt.